Uh huh. Yeah. So now it should be recording. Yeah. Uh, no, the the uh, it seems like the Stream Deck controls is is out of sync uh, uh, because it now says that I sh well no recording is going on. Uh, but anyhow, uh, I'm just gonna close the door. So welcome to this uh, lecture on on uh, the fifth and sixth theme. Uh, so so uh, the theme or the, the topic for today is to to design with reason, uh, because uh, design with reasoning is is uh, uh, one of the essential activities in 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 uh, uh, software architecture and. Uh, the learning outcomes for for today is is uh, to uh, say a few words about uh, architectural reasoning in relation to to uh, general design, also thinking, and and to some extent also about uh, agreement. And um, today we will also try to to connect all the loose ends, uh, trying to to. Uh, uh well at the end say a few words about uh not just the the learning outcomes for today's lecture but actually the the learning outcomes uh, for for the entire course um this is the last sort of say uh extra lecture uh, this year but um coming back to this picture and and uh, now we put reasoning in the middle uh, reasoning is 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 a, a, a an essential well essential activity uh, when we iterate through the the design uh, architecture design uh, process uh, where we uh, develop strategies because we need to reason about well which strategy we should use. Uh, we need to, to reason about how to adopt that strategy or adopt that, that pattern or adopt that tactic or whatever we pick and choose and how to combine them into a strategy. Because uh, as you all know, with software, there are, are uh, an indefinite number of possible solutions. There is not never a thing like the only solution. There, there is always many, many uh, more solutions possible. However, uh, the different solutions uh, have different properties. One might be a little bit more costly than another. Another one might be a little bit more efficient when it comes to, so to say, time. Uh, but you have to pay a penalty in terms of memory. So, so you need to store more in the local memory uh, for to speed up processing with caching, etc. Uh, but then you have to sort of say reason about, well, which configuration is, is the best one for, for your strategy. So, uh, it's all about this, what we talked about last time, finding the right decision first. So in principle, you can start with reasoning with yourself and say, okay, what would be the best solution for this concern or this architecturally significant requirement? And, and and part of that process, you need to, so to say, reason about pros and cons with patterns, tactics, all this and that. But then in the second step, you remember from the design uh, process that we talked about where you had a, after you found the best fit, you had to, so to say, start negotiating 
uh, to adjust it so that it matched not just one specific uh, problem, but the whole, so to say, system, uh, the resulting system that, that uh, uh, deals with many more problems. And part of that game is also reasoning because trade-offs, uh, trade-off where you sort of say, for instance, you trade memory performance or well, memory requirements with the uh, speed. So in order to get more speed, you have to invest more in memory. So expensive here, you get speed here. Can you do that? Or how much money can you invest in, in memory in order to get how much speed? in your computations? Well, that's an example of, 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 of reasoning in order to, to uh, so to say, get your uh, decisions adopted for, for, for the system you're designing. So as an architect, it's not just about finding the needle, it's also about, so to say, reasoning about how to adopt or, or apply that needle in the system you're currently designing. So what is design then? Well, if you go to uh, a dictionary, they say decide upon the look and functioning of, well, some examples here, a building, garment or other object by making a detailed drawing of it. So uh, in computer science or software engineering, well, uh, we don't have tangible products. Software is not something that you can see or touch, but you can see the different representations of that software. You can see the source code. You can see the class model. You can see the different models that models various aspects of that software, but you can't see the, the, the compiled code. You can see representation. So the drawing here is actually the models. You create a model of some objects, look and functioning, structure, behavior. And then you create a model. So having that in mind, one can start to uh, compare software design to design in other areas. So if you design a tangible thing, well, are the processes any different than the processes we use when we design software? Are the uh, questions you ask yourself as a designer different than if you're a designer in a different area? What do we say? Do you have any good guesses? What do you say? Are, are the, do we face the same questions or? Similar questions. I would say similar questions, maybe even a little bit more than just similar. To some extent, it's the we have the same questions. What's what differs is is really like constraints. So so uh, uh, if you design the look. What is the design? What is the, the look of a software component? Well, yeah, the software itself, the, the user interface, the UX part, that is something that com comes really close to, to, to uh, this type of design, where you design for look, you design for function. Uh, but if, if you have a, a if you have a, a software component, what what is the look? What do you think would be the uh, what is the look of a uh, 
software component or subsystem? Well, the look is what others see. So if you look into the area of API design, how do you design APIs? Well, you will come pretty close to, to, to the outside view on software components, the look of a software component. So there are certain qualities, certain design patterns, certain constraints that you can work with in order to come up with something. I'm not sure if you ever heard this, but, but you hear it from time to time that I really like this framework because the APIs are so easy to use and easy to understand and so on and so forth, really intuitive. Whereas for other frameworks, no one ever uses them because they are so difficult to understand and they are completely non-intuitive, et cetera, et cetera. So you can think of design also for, of software for components also, well, similar to, to, to design of an artifact or, well, a cell phone or whatever it is. Um, but, but you have to, to sort of say, extend your, your uh, reasoning a bit. Uh, something that has, has become really popular in, 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 in recent years is, is something called design thinking. What is design thinking? Well, the design thinking is, is a process that combines exploration of a design space. So, so a very creative process looking for new ideas spawn new ideas, explore new ideas, etc. But the second leg is a little bit more, okay, let's take that idea and see if we can do something with it, given these, all these constraints. Because if you can have a wonderful idea, but if the constraint is, well, you make, you should make it out of wood or paper or whatever, that puts constraints on what you can actually do with that material. So uh, design thinking is a process where you sort of say combine creativity and realistic expectations in a structured process that, that works iteratively and incrementally to design and also implement prototypes, concepts of things. We can use a similar approach for software. However, when it comes to design thinking, how much creativity do we really see in software design? Are software designers in that respect, do they have the same degree of creativity as well, a, an industrial designer, you think? Are we, as an industry, asking for that creativity? Someone online who has an opinion? Well, I would say that not really. Because we're not designing tangible things. When it comes to user interfaces, sure. You see a lot of creativity there. Just look at, well, download a computer game. And well, there is a lot of 
interesting things going on there. A lot of creativity. But uh, how much creativity do we have when we design classes? Well, methods and operations. Hmm, well, we have the, the methods here. Uh, what can I do? Not much. APIs, sure, we have different approaches that will lead in different directions and the end product will be different. So, so to some extent, but it's not much creativity in that process. But the basic idea here of, of exploring a design space and then bring it back down closer to, to brown earth with realistic conditions. That's, that's kind of more close to, to what we see with software. You uh, pick an idea, you have that as your candidate for, in this case, a strategy. You combine patterns, you combine tactics, but then at the end of the day, after a number of iterations, you have started to sort of say, drag it back down to brown earth, closer to, to, to what you have in your, on your architectural runway. You have to adopt to that. You need to, to uh, make sure that you don't uh, uh, consume all resources, et cetera, et cetera. So, in that respect, the process is similar, but in fact, software designers are never that creative as industrial designers or uh, UX designers for that way. Uh, so when it comes to software design, this is, well, of course, not just uh, for architecture design, but software design in, in general, since we have this, this encapsulation modularity principles that we, we work with in order to master complexity, well, there is always a, a, an interface design or API design aspect. Uh, and then the internal one, which is uh, at the lowest level uh, about uh, constructing a, an algorithm for individual methods or whatever, uh, you have options there, you make decisions there, but, but you have this internal external design as one dimension. Uh, and uh, the uh, external internal also to some extent controls uh, the effect of your decision. So decision effect, it may have a local effect and a global effect. So if you have an API design and if you have make a mistake in, well, how you, how you define your, your, your uh, method, for instance, well, then that might, have global consequences. If you uh, make a bad design choice on the inside, it might just have a local effect. Then we have direct and indirect. Well, you can have local, global, direct, but you can also have local, global, indirect effects. Can you think of an indirect effect that is global? What do you mean by indirect? Would be the natural question if you don't understand that. Uh, well, most languages today have uh, they they have an automatic memory management system. So so you allocate objects, and then when they are not used anymore, they are freed up automatically by this memory management mechanism. 
Some languages don't have automatic memory management. So if you mismanage memory, you use up memory for, well, an internal data structure where you allocate memory to store data or whatever, and then forget to free it up. It might be that you have a memory leak. So every time someone invokes this operation, well, some memory is used. And since it's not managed properly, at some point you will run out of memory. That is an indirect effect. So it's something that can affect others, not directly, but indirectly, because it can be a decision that has an indirect effect globally somewhere else, well, a completely different sort of a place in your system suddenly runs out of memory. An indirect effect of this memory leak. So another example of, of the effect is, is, is the trade-off. You know that, that when we design our systems, well, there are competition for computational resources, memory, bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we also have other parameters like cost, time, etc. And we need to balance all these conditions so that we satisfy the, the goals, the stakeholders' concerns. And this is a really complex equation system to, to, to solve because there is a huge number of, of unknowns in here. And we can uh, vary the different values, so to say, indefinitely. But what it means is that, well, you have to sometime trade, for instance, quality for time. You can always invest time perfecting your implementation, making it a little bit better, but you don't have time or you can't afford it. So you need to trade one property for another. In the recorded lectures, there are a number of examples related to, to security, which is a property that is desirable and performance which is another property that is also desirable we also have for instance usability so if you want to make something really secure you have to consider okay how much will this cost us in terms of performance and how much will it cost us in terms of usability? So it's not good enough just to say, okay, this is really secure. This satisfies the security requirements. Therefore, we're satisfying the concern that these stakeholders have. Because these stakeholders may also have performance requirements. And it could be that, now I'm pointing to the guys in the room, that you have some, so there's a requirement for performance and you have another requirement for performance. So you need to balance not just the properties, but also the stakeholders' concerns. 
So when it comes to software design, it's 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 pretty. Uh, maybe I'm I'm using a the wrong word here, but it's it's kind of it's it's kind of simple if you just consider one user. If you just consider one property, and you have like an indefinite resource uh, number of resources, time, money, computational power, etc., then it then it's it's basic, it's straightforward. Then of course you have complex problems that well require some thinking to solve, but 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 actually coming up with a system when when you have understood how to do it, well that's then it's pretty straightforward. But when you have huge projects, lots of stakeholders, lots of people involved, lots of requirements, then the complexity starts to kick in and then it becomes more and more difficult. Because besides trade-offs, we have the fact that we have to make sure that we maintain integrity. And since I know that that you have taken a software testing class, I will ask you if you know what regression testing is. And now you should not shake your head, you should not. I don't see the guys online, but uh, Regression testing, you know, when you do uh, testing, you have your software component and you perform unit tests or integration tests, but, but unit tests is, okay, we test this unit, we test this module, we test this class, we test the methods in, these, in this class, but it's important to remember that when you test, you test at a certain point in time. And if you change something, it might well be that what you have already tested is dependent on what you have changed. So do you know for sure that what you have tested and you know worked still works? And now you can shake your head because you can't, you don't know that. So what you have to do then is to test again with a new implementation of this method or with the addition of this component here, have we kept the integrity? Does it still work? And for that, you create these regression test uh, suites that you can run overnight to make sure that, okay, it works, all the unit works, and then you can run the integration tests, and then you can run the system test, and eventually you can uh, deploy. So the same thing holds for your architecture decisions. Because you have dependencies, you have the trade-offs. So if you have one architectural increment where you have done something to your runway, you have made a couple of decisions, you have something that you know works, but now you have gone through a new iteration. You have added things, decisions to deal with additional requirements. Are the decisions you made in the previous iterations still okay? Hopefully, because, uh, but you don't know. So you need to, to, to always check with what you have as part of the decision process before you go ahead with a decision. So it's not regression testing in the sense that, that you, you run something overnight. It's something that, well, part of the game. It's not just that it works, but also it works with what we have. 
that's integrity. Uh, okay. So, architecture reasoning is in the middle of this process. You have your concerns, you start there, uh, you specify requirements for the concerns, uh, you uh, document these requirements some way as stories or as uh, in some other format. But then you start your, your, your design activity, the decision activity where you uh, work with knowledge that you have or that you find. And then this process of decision-making starts where you have options and now you have to end up with the decision. Start with the right decision and then start adopting. Adopting to what you have adopting to the constraints and adopting means managing the trade-offs. Eventually you will add something to a strategy or you will complete the strategy and that's documented in your views. But the architect here on the left is actually working with uh, probably the toughest activity of them all in architecture design when we talk about architecture recently that's where it's really difficult sometimes and sometimes you can't even be sure that you're making the right decisions so I know that you students, you love it when there is no right answer. <laughs> and, and especially when no one can say if it's the right answer or not. But reasoning is challenging. It's not a machinery where you sort of say, enter a solution, you grind it and out comes the answer, yes. It's a lot about manual work. You can do testing, of course. You can, you can code parts of your, uh, or, well, parts of your architectural decisions will translate into code that you can compile and you can check and you can run tests and all this and that. But often you can't get the full answer. That is extremely time consuming to do and costly. And of course, you don't always have that time to, to do sort of a reasoning at that level. Instead, you have to retreat to more cheaper but less precise activities. And at the end of the day, we have something that can be summarized in this picture here. And that is uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And this is, this is something that is not just a condition for uh, uh, software systems, but it is really common in software systems. Volatility, well, volatility means that things can change. And they can change without notice. A simple example of volatility is, is network connection. You can have an extremely good connection in this room. And then suddenly, you have no connection. 
So you have fluctuation in various conditions. Uncertainty. Well, the volatility is an example of something that results in uncertainty. Because when you design your system, when you make your decision, well, you assume certain conditions. You assume connectivity. But if you can't guarantee connectivity, you have some uncertainty that you have to take into consideration when you design your system. And uncertainty is really something that has exploded in recent years. Since we're now, well, back in the days where you had a, you had a one computer on your desk running software with data, code on that computer, life was much easier for us at that time. What is it now? Three weeks ago, I found an old laptop on my, in my office. I didn't know how old it was, but I, I, I well, I pushed the start button and, and it, it booted. Uh, after checking the disk, it turned out it was uh, Windows NT and it was from 2003. Running. Uh, I found some files there, super interesting files that I, I was looking for them. I had been looking for them for, for some time. It was like old work I did during the 90s. Okay, now I start copying. There is no Wi-Fi. No wireless network. That's 20 years ago. Connectivity was cable. So I was starting, okay, now the cable doesn't work in my room because we have Wi-Fi. So option two, uh, USB. No, no USB. So no Wi-Fi, no USB, uh, floppy disk. Yeah. There was a floppy disk drive on it, but I don't have a floppy disk drive working on any of my other computers, so no use. I don't, I'm not sure if I have a working floppy disk either. But well, uncertainty now is is really triggered by this network connectivity, open system where you can plug not just other systems, you can plug with hardware. You have a headphones using well. Bluetooth, you have devices, you have sensors, everything can come and go more or less in any way it wants. And that means that when we design a system, what will the system look like? We don't know. Many years ago, when, when uh, the manufacturers of printers uh, tested their device drivers, this was way before the, the well, Microsoft and other uh, operating system producers actually had a decent structure for device drivers. Well, what, when the device drivers came from the printer manufacturers and didn't have really support in the, in the operating systems, how did they test device drivers? Well, they had halls full of different computers, different configurations, different brands, different printers from their make, testing, 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 testing. We don't do that now because there are just too many configurations. So instead, we have to think about, well, what's certain what do we know and what do we know that we don't know? We don't know that we always have network connectivity. We can make that assumption. And if that assumption doesn't hold, we say, okay, then we don't, it doesn't work. But most stakeholders don't like that. 
they would like something that is a little bit more robust, resilient to such uncertainties. Um, complexity itself is one of the big challenges. As I said before, there are so many decisions that depend on other decisions. There are decisions that will depend on previous decisions. And when you make a decision, you will also make future decisions dependent on that decision. You know the funnel. To make it right, to get it right, we need to somehow track these decisions, these, these dependencies, so that we can check, so that we can make this regression testing, so to speak, to make sure that we maintain the integrity of the system. And then we have ambiguities, uh, statements that have more than one meaning. So your understanding of performance and your understanding of performance. Performance, but not necessarily the same. So uh, ambiguities is another one that that really messes up uh, a, a for a software designer, and especially when it comes to architectural research. So uh, Design thinking for, for architects, then, well, this is the uh, iterative, iterative uh, design process where you compare options, you manage trade offs, you evaluate the candidate, you go back and forth, and you work with this until you have something that you believe is good enough. So yes, there is to some extent a design thinking approach to architecting. However, as I mentioned in the beginning, typically we don't explore the design space that much. And the reason for that is that the uncertainty, volatility, complexity, ambiguity. Well, if we stay with the known, what we know, what others have done, we are much better at predicting the outcome. If we start exploring the, the design space too much, it might well be that we end up somewhere where our systems fail. And that is, of course, extremely costly. So. Typically, we don't make these uh, explorations into the design space. So let's see if we can make this a little bit practical. And this is the last time you will see Jed's rental. And just to recap, you remember that, that this was a, a rental management system. And, and Jed has ha had a, an office, so to say, driven business uh, uh, where customers come to the uh, office, possibly they, they make a phone, phone call in advance to, to make reservations and so on, but now they would like to, to move to, to a more modern app-based uh, service for their customer. Uh, so um, then we had a typical customer for Jed, uh, Lisa, she owns a, a uh, event company. And she's concerned with uh, quick responses. She plan together with customers and, and she would really like to make sure that response times are good enough. So that her process is not affected by a system where you have to wait for, for answers on your uh, queries. Uh, 
And then we have the design team here. Well, we have designers, developers, and some architects here. And now it's time for them to, to incrementally, iteratively dig out the performance requirements from Lisa and turn them into a strategy, performance strategy that takes care of Lisa's concerns. But at the same time, they also have to deal with the other stakeholders concern, performance concern. And as we talked about before, it might be that their architecturally significant requirements are slightly different. So what's good enough for Lisa might not be good enough for Judy or any of the other stakeholders. So the architects in the developer development team here, they must in the reasoning process, make sure that they satisfy all stakeholders. So uh, start with the concern, come up with a quality attribute scenario that describes Lisa's performance requirements. So how should the system respond to guarantee that Lisa's requirements are met? And then you can, in that scenario, you can weave in requirements from, from other stakeholders. And then in step three, when you have this quality attribute scenario, you can start looking for uh, tactics. You can start looking for patterns. And then you take out the general quality attribute scenario for performance. You know where you find the possible tactics that you can apply to achieve well or meet performance requirements. That general quality attribute scenario will provide you with options. But then, well, you have to make a selection and you have to make sure that your selection is good enough, that it fits what you have. You maintain integrity before you sort of say, make the final decision and say that, okay, here's my strategy for performance for this system that we will deliver to JET. And that can be documented in a way that Lisa understands, that Judy understands, and possibly also JET. And that might be a challenge. And remember that you should also document for the development team so that they know what to develop. So typical reasoning scenarios that we talk about a little bit more in detail in other lectures. Uh, well, evaluate your strategy of fitness with respect to your uh, architecture requirements. Evaluate different options and identify and balance trade-offs. So reasoning is not just one activity, it's a number of different activities and sometimes you combine activities. Maybe you evaluate your, not just one design option, but you have multiple design options that you evaluate. And you end up with some, some candidates where you, okay, hmm, what if we go for this decision, what would be the trade-offs? Or if we go for the other decision, what would be the trade-offs? It might be that if you go for this one, it will be a little bit less performant, 
but it's easier to integrate with what we have. So, so it's not a straightforward decision if you add all these dimensions. It's much more complex. Thing. But with your general quality attribute scenario here, tactics to control performance, well, events arrive, Lisa's query, do we have 20 tables available for this weekend? Can we provide the guarantees that Lisa will see a response within some time? And if so, how can we do that? Uh, well, there are different categories of, of tactics here, resource demand, resource management, and arbitration. And, and uh, performance is actually not a simple quality. It's, it's complex. How, do you, how, do, how can you guarantee that, that uh, some software running on my computer here will respond on time? I can guarantee that. It's not an easy question to answer, but there are methods. I'm not an expert in this field. This is that's why I'm just very shallow here. Uh, but when you work with performance, you have analytical models to complement your your sort of say conceptual models. You use your conceptual models to to develop analytical models where you can come pretty close to a to a the real answer. You can use simulations. You can have let's say um, tools that that uh, simulates uh, waves of events here to 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 check if your ideas are are are, are sound or not. The three categories. And when it comes to, 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 to resource demand, well, there are some here on the right-hand side, which are, are pretty nice. You can always make your code efficient. So you reduce overhead, uh, increase efficiency. You can, you can optimize various ways. You can uh, manage jobs and job sizes. So simple example, even though it's typically managed by the databases here, but, but if you have a complex query, it takes more time to process than if you have a basic simple query. So you have, if you have big, uh, well, big databases that you need to sort of say, combine and, and, and search into and so on. That takes more, much more time, of course, than if you have just support, just basic searches. So, so this is one of the examples of, of what you can do to, to, to manage this problem. Because if you have less resource demand, it's, it's more likely that you have enough resources to process the, the uh, arriving event on time. But then, well, you have to evaluate the cost and the benefit. Can we live with that? Is it okay for Lisa if we support really basic quest queries? She can't, we can't process super complex queries. It might be, yeah, but it might also be, no, we need this. So then you have to, continue looking because the cost is greater than the benefit. 
Another category is, is resource management. Increase resources, add more memory, add more computational power. Hmm. Might be an option. Say that you uh, make a decision here. Mm, yeah, let's go full AWS or some other cloud service. You have scaling, you get it. It costs you, but it might be worth while. Because if you do scaling, well, it might be that you get multiple copies of the data. You can have multiple copies of the computation. So you can actually process not just Lisa's queries one by one, but you can have multiple queries running in parallel. So you can have concurrency. So uh, resource management is definitely a viable option, especially today when you have decent support or even more than decent support uh, from these uh, big uh, cloud providers. So, uh, now we have our options here. What should we pick? Well, our poor architects here, they should now evaluate the design options. And if you, uh, if you go for one of the big vendors, they probably have a service level agreements that you may be seen in an assignment or so where they actually have an agreement with you as a customer that we will provide you this service level. So if you pay a little bit more, you will get more service from us. If you pay less, well then, you will have to go with the, the bronze package. So evaluation here might be, okay, hmm, should we go for uh, Microsoft or should we go for Google, or should we go for AWS? And suddenly that decision, probably they are pretty equal when it comes to the functionality, but suddenly it might become a, an issue of money, support, availability, or for us here in Europe, where is the data stored? you know, GDPR. So a performance consideration might be stopped by the fact that, hmm, no, we cannot ship the data to the US. So you see that, that even if there is a straightforward solution, it might mean that, mean that or it could be that we have to step back and say, hey, okay, we have to do something on our own. And if we do something on our own, well, we're back on square one. I have to come up with a homebrew strategy. And for that strategy, well, we can use verification. We can do proofs, we use analytical mathematical models, queuing, tech, uh, queuing models, et cetera. But we can also do argument by our argumentation, we can reason uh, about, well, trying to convince people that what we are done is actually good enough. And then of course, we can also run demonstrations, simulations and so on. So evaluation is not always straightforward. And if we go for a big vendor, approach where we have AWS, for instance, well, they have their reference architecture. And that reference architecture will provide us with the structure. It tells us which components are needed. It also gives us patterns for how to use it. This is, this is the same for, for all of them, the big guys. Uh, but 
if we don't have that, if we don't have that possibility, well, it might be that we have to come back to this peer-to-peer -peer or client-server, client-server where we share data and we can do things to the server to, to uh, speed up increased resources, for instance. But now we have like an idea for things that we can do, but we can do it in using or applying different patterns. So we can compare response times and throughputs for, for the uh, client server example on the left hand side. And here we have some, some, some load balancer in the middle. And this load balancer is like our auto scaling <laughs> feature that we designed on our own. On the right hand side, we have a peer to peer, which I'm not sure is really feasible in this particular application, but it's, it's uh, because it requires that we actually ship some parts of the servers to the clients as well. So even if Lisa is, is in a customer meeting, planning an event, uh, parts of her application is acting server to another customer making processes, processing on. So, so maybe in this case, it's not feasible, but it's just to prove, well, a point that we have two design options here. Still, we can use analytical models to, to, to measure response time and throughput on, on the computations. And, and eventually, well, cost becomes an issue, time becomes an issue, complexity, everything. This is pro probably much more real, robust than this one, because here every, every component or every entity in, in the peer-to-peer -peer is a client, a server, and a load balancer. Security is more challenging in a peer-to-peer -peer than a uh, client server. So, so whatever option you bring up here, or whatever concern you bring up here, you will find differences. And this is what it's all about, to, to, to figure out what option is good enough and actually the best decision for this system. And eventually we come up with this little uh, client server approach. And this might be running somewhere on a cloud provider, but we can also do it in-house. If we do it in-house, well, we have to do all the operations on our own, hosting, etc. Costly, more costly development, more costly maintenance. Uh, we have, we will face uh, obsolete hardware that we have to replace. There will be backup issues, et cetera, et cetera. So many considerations in, in these decisions. And at the end of the day, it might be GDPR, so we must do this. But now we come to the next interesting step here, because now we have a performance strategy. We believe that this strategy is, 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 is working. And now we have to first convince our stakeholders that this is something they believe in. So Lisa, well, I'm not sure, I'm not certain, but I can always almost say I am that if we come up with a analytical mathematical model that of the performance for this computation computing system and show it to her 
she will not understand that model. So in order to, to, to sort of say, convince her that, well, this is actually met, if she requires, requires us to do that before we have the final system, well, then we need to look more into scenarios, walkthroughs, et cetera. More like, well, you know, if, if the system becomes too, if, it, if, it, if there is too much load on the system, well, we will spawn a new server and we will, we will start, so to say, using that to, to, to uh, uh, make the computations, which means that the load will never exceed the level where we cannot meet your, so to say, expectations on response times and throughput. So scenarios, walkthroughs, arguments to convince stakeholders. So that was, I should do it like that. That was from concerns, so architectural significant requirements, knowledge, options, reasoning decisions, a strategy, and then back to the view for documentation. So that was the full thing. That was the architecture design process. But as I said, this was the simple case. This was the simple case where you have performance. We don't even look at the software, the, the significant requirements here. We just say performance, but it can be many things. So iterative and incremental, integrity and quality, we need to, so to say, make sure that the security mechanism works here. This security strategy works here. The information security strategy works here. The system is still usable. All the concerns, integrity, iterative and incremental. We have runway increments, architectural increments that where you add possibly something that is, is related to performance in one iteration together with something that is related with security. And then in the next iteration, you add something more to the performance. And then a couple of iterations down the road, you add more security. So managing iterative and incremental is challenging. And doing it at the architectural level is possibly even more challenging than what it is for, for code on that level. Stakeholder communication, that's a big thing. You've seen in the, in the literature and in, in, in the, the lectures, you talk about architecture assessment, processes like ATAM and so on, where the focus is really on talking to your stakeholders. Figure out what they want. Then show them something, a possible solution. And make sure that they become a part of the assessment, the evaluation. Because most often these guys know a lot, sometimes even more than you. And then as in any development product, we have the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, not, not something that is unique for architectural level, but the architectural level is more challenging to manage this because when it comes to complexity, we're talking about the big picture, big parts of the system. Talk about fairly complex mechanisms. And most often we don't have a running system. We have parts of it at best. So uh, this is a simple case, but many of the things we talked about in this class is actually about uh, all the other cases that are not simple, because that's when you see the real benefits of, of, of this structure, sometimes uh, too much ceremony approach. 
So decision making is simple when you're on your own. No one will complain. It's just you. Thinking can can actually be a structured activity. Even creativity can be structured. An agreement is imperative. You must agree with your stakeholders. You must agree within the development team. Architectural decisions is about agreement. So uh, when you design as a team, that activity requires structure because then you're not on your own. When it comes to thinking, should you explore or should you exploit? More or less, should you try to find something or should you try to use something? Well, it depends. As I said previously, if someone has done it before, someone has also sort of they made all the mistakes. So hopefully by using what others have done, you can cut some corners and still end up where you want. So um, this was today's lecture about architectural reasoning. And this is also, well, so to say, completing the, the software architecture 101, which is about understanding stakeholders and their concerns, make the right design decisions and document these decisions in a way that stakeholders understand the design and can say, yes, this meet, meets our expectations. So uh, identify stakeholders and their concerns, specify the requirements, develop strategies, combine the strategies into an architectural runway and document in views, depending upon the requirements the stakeholders have. And a simple case is always there. Do you really need to do this? Do I need to create a model? Do I need to make the architecture explicit? We all know that all software systems have an implicit architecture. There is an architecture. Do you need to make it explicit? Well, it depends. If you're on your own, if the system is not long lived, you make something, you solve a problem, you use it, you throw it away. Don't spend time on this. Why? Quality is not imperative. It's about solving a problem. So security performance, not important. Well, you don't have to do this. If it's just about functionality, well, do it. But if it's not, if you're part of a big team, if you face somewhat more challenging uh, development task, well, it might be worthwhile to, to, to sort of say, try to put some structure into your work, especially if you're a team and you need to align how you work and your target. And then stakeholders and their concerns is a nice entry point. Various ways to specify, to elicit the requirements from the stakeholders for the concerns. Make use of the knowledge, tactics, patterns. So cutting corners, finding a shorter path to, to the goal. Use a structured way to, to reason about options, to come up with a decision candidate and, and make sure that this decision is actually a good enough decision. 
that it results in a strategy that that can actually be developed in your system by the team to make sure that the requirements or the concerns are met. And then at the end of the day, find the tools to communicate within a team and externally, with management, with customers, with other stakeholders well then some of the things you've hopefully picked up from this course will be useful but don't go architecting with your so to say toy project at home but uh, that's it so uh trying to connecting the dots with the final slide so, um, do you have any questions? Yeah. This is this is the last live lecture. Yes. Yeah, you have you have you have the pre-recorded videos. I I made some other videos now in the. Uh, recent weeks that I will upload also to, to complement. I know, I know. We we have scheduled more lectures, but but this is like my sketch my other sketch. Well, I do other things than teach. I do a lot of other things. So so we we schedule so to say uh, just in case. Yeah. So so it might be that we have a, a Q and A session or something uh to prepare for the for the exam or something that that we put on that slot but it's just to like a placeholder so this is it yeah okay so the question is about the uh we start with lauren's question because uh Yes, there will be an example exam. So we'll actually not just see one question, you will see four questions. Um, so, so the setup for the exam is that we have like a uh, multiple choice uh, timed part. And that is mostly sort of a knowledge. It's, it checks knowledge, not that you should reason, compare, reflect any of the other things that you, you, you see in, 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 in Bloom's, so to say, uh, level of, of, of learning, levels of learning. Uh, but, but it has turned out that I've done this course for, well, I'm looking at my watch, but it says I probably, 25 years or so, not this court. Well, it has changed, but what I've seen is that, that if you don't know the basic things, if you don't know what a, if I say architecture pattern, if you don't know what a pattern is or what a pattern, so to say some properties of a pattern or what a tactic is or what a strategy. If you don't know that, you will not have the time to complete the essay questions. Because there is a group of students who think that they don't have to study, that they can actually, since this is an open book, uh, the essay question, well, you, you can use the book, you can use the lectures, you can use whatever. But if you don't know the basics, it doesn't matter because then you will spend too much time looking for information. So this little 10 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever it is, uh, filter actually boosted the pass rate a lot with almost 30% units. So it's 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 fairly high. If if you make it through that filter, it's 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 quite likely that you will make it. Uh, what it used to be was that that I got a lot of exams, 
And there were a lot of students that shouldn't have, so to say, tried because they didn't know the basics. So what you have is, is, is when you complete the, when you complete the, the uh, multiple, uh, the, 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 what's it called? The test, the quiz, we get a timestamp. If you pass, we get a timestamp. So you completed it, you passed. Now we open the essay for you. So the essay is, is now available to you. So you can download it, you can open, you can start working. Now you have, I'm not sure what Francis said. I'm not, I'm not managing this. So, so some hours minus 15 minutes to complete the, so if it's uh, five, five hours, 45 minutes or something, or if it's four hours, 45 minutes, I'm, I'm not sure. But, it, but we say you use 15 minutes for the, for the quiz, and then you have the rest of the full time. So we can actually see, given with the timestamp there, that you don't spend nine hours or eight hours. So, so if you do that, we <clears throat> get a little bit angry. So when we grade. Uh, so uh, that, that is, that is the, so to say, the time aspect. Uh, the exam will cover uh, what's in the reading instructions. What the lectures are, are highlights of content. There are study questions uh, for each and every chapter. Uh, so so that, that is, if you, if you look at the, the learning outcomes for the course, those questions, if you know the answers to those questions, if you know the practices from the assignments, well, you're home safe. In the written test, it's mainly the non-practical parts. It might be that there is some element of, of, of design, but not something complicated. So yes, the exam covers a, lot of, a large part of the course, but, but not the practical aspects. For that, we have the assignments. When I say, when, when I get a question like not UML design, I would say it might be that we ask you to, to draw a first level decomposition just to, to so to say support your uh, discussion regarding some question, but, but it will not be so to say in line with the questions you have on the assignment, which is much more, so to say, on the practical end of things. Okay. Very good. So uh, there are a couple of tutoring sessions left, so so make good use of them and, and uh, Invest time preparing for the exam. It pays off. Guarantee. So take care. Um, you guys online. Take care, you too. Uh, see you around. Goodbye. <laughs>